Cool, so I am AJ Grand Scrutton and I am the uh, CEO of Delala Studios. Um, the reason I always say CEO is because the reality is I run my studio from my mum's garage. Um, on one side of my desk I have my nan's freezer, the other side I have a washing machine. Um, Craig, my partner in crime, give us a wave Craig. Craig, give us a wave. Cool, so Craig has been on many Skype calls with me where we've been in big important meetings and my lovely little 84 year old nan will suddenly creep on the screen to get some chicken out for the dogs. I'll be like, Nan, I'm in a meeting. Not quite understanding technology, she'll do this. <laughs> um, but yeah, so, you know, it's, it's not glamorous. We are very much indie in that sense. We're a five-man studio situated across the country. We don't have a centralised office. We work remotely because we're cheap. Um, but I won't talk, talk, talk too much about the studio because Craig will be doing that later on about three, half three? There we go, cool. Um, so yeah, I'm here to talk about production. So usually when I do talks, so I've done like develop and the game horizon, all those sort of rounds. Um, I usually just come up here and talk shit for about 40 minutes um, about myself and about the studio. Uh, so I had to actually try and do a talk with a point. Uh, so yeah, good luck to everyone on that. Um, the slides, don't pay too much attention. These are not going to be pretty slides with lots of factual information. They're going to be pictures of stuff like Dawson's Creek to remind me what I'm meant to be saying to you guys. Um, so if there is anything you want more details on, my Twitter's there, my email is aj at delalastudios.com. You're more than welcome to email me at any point and ask any questions, and I will happily help as much as I can. Um, what I will start by saying is, this is rated E for Essex. So as you can tell from my lovely drawl, I am an Essex boy. Um, what this probably means is half of you won't understand half the words I'm saying. I'm going to probably swear a lot, and a lot of it's just going to be incoherent in general. Um, so if you are easily offended, you're fucked, basically. Um, <laughs> cool, so this skip. So this is a bit about me. Um, so I go under the assumption that no one has a fucking clue who I am. So I'll do a really quick introduction on who I am, what I've done briefly. Um, has anyone ever heard me talk before? Fantastic, I can rehash stuff I've already used. Brilliant. Um, cool, so... Like most of your fine lovely selves, I went to university, um, did a degree, uh, I was just speaking about this, so I did a degree in either computer science, which ended up turning into computer software development, or it was computer software development which turned into computer science. Um, and without actually looking at my certificate, I couldn't actually tell you what I've got a degree in. Um, so yeah, I went there. Wasn't the best of boys. I, I like to say my university time was kind of more like I enrolled, I passed my coursework and exams, and occasionally I turned up to lectures when I felt like it, which is the main reason I only got a Desmond, a 2-2 in my degree classification. Um, but kind of, I made some big mistakes there. I'm not here to tell you the wonders of education, because you're already in education, so you don't need that. But I, I didn't listen to advice I got from my peers, from people who already been through the education system, um, and for a couple of my better lecturers. And I literally thought edu getting an education meant just doing the work I was given in class. Um, and when it comes to the games industry, this was a big fuck up on my part. You know, I should have been working on stuff in my own time, should have been making games if I wanted to make games, you know, should have been doing research, should have been doing a lot more. Um, but you know, especially back when I was in university, whenever that was, 10 years ago now, I think ish, um, you know, we were under the impression it was a magic bit of paper. You know, a lot of us got told when we were in secondary school, oh, you need a degree to get a job, and, but when you get that degree, you're going to walk into 60 grand, you know. You'll walk out those university doors and everyone will be at your feet saying, AJ, AJ, here's a job. Oh, as long as your name's AJ, obviously. If your name's not AJ, then that wouldn't be very relevant. Um, but this was a mistake. That's not the reality, you know. You don't walk out of university just doing the bare minimum, getting your pass, getting your degree, and you don't walk into a fantastic job. Because if you look at everyone sitting next to you and sitting opposite you, they're doing the same degree as you. They're going to probably end up with similar classifications if they do the same amount of work. So you need to be doing something to be distinctive, to stick out. You need to make sure you're doing more than what your work you're given. You need to be making sure that if you want to make games for a living, then you are making games. Quite often when I say this at universities, you know, people say to me, oh, yeah, but I don't have time, I don't have time to make games. Then five minutes later, they'll say oh, how far are you into the new Alien? I've been playing it, I completed it over the weekend. Um, and the horrible reality is this, you know, if you've got time to play games, you're late. The one person I was relying on, it's all gone horrible. Um, if you've got time to play games, you've got time to make games. And you know, I know right now you want to be buying games, you want to be playing them, you want to be hang hanging out with your mates, getting drunk. Everyone is in university in legal age, I can say stuff, right? You know, you want to be going and doing stuff which you're probably not meant to be doing, but that's not going to help you in the future, you know? 
you're going to end up fat and hairy like me. <laughs> Sorry, girls, not necessarily you. Um, <coughs> but if you don't do the work, you know, that's all you'll have. You'll have this amazing time at university. Oh, I made such great friends, did such amazing things. But it's all going to mean jack shit in the long run. Um, so get your heads down. If you are wanting to make games for a living, if this isn't just a, d a degree to keep your parents happy, you know, then start making games because that is the best experience you can get. The end. No. Um, so I went to university and I didn't do any of the things I just told you. And what that meant was I spent the next seven months looking for a job. And this wasn't just kind of applying for a job here and there. This was I was getting up at seven o'clock every morning. I was going to bed at midnight every night. I was applying for every games job I could find, doing online tests, going in for interviews. Kept hearing the same thing. Oh, so you want to be a games programmer. So what games programming have you got? Oh, no, I, I did this module on my course. Yeah, but what, what practical experience can you show us? Didn't get any of these jobs. Seven months, I'm grafting hard, doing my best. And eventually, after trying so hard, having this magical bit of paper and all this knowledge of the games industry, click. I ended up getting a job as an IT technician at Timber Merchant for £11,500 a year. Um, and that's reality. So has anybody here ever watched the IT crowd? Show of hands, please. I like interaction. That is glamorous compared to what my life was. I tell this story, and no one believes me, but I actually had people on the end of the phone ringing me saying, I've got this problem, and it was obviously, I would say, have you tried turning it off and on again? Only issue was, they didn't know how to turn it off and on again. So I'd actually have to get out, leave my building, go across an industrial estate to a separate building, and that physically turn their machines off and on again. And this is what I thought my life was going to be. All those dreams I had as a four-year-old kid wanting to be the guy making Mario, they were quickly dying because I thought, you know, I was going to be spending my time looking after timber merchant employees. Um, but I kept persevering. Like a lot of pretentious 20-somethings, instead of working on a game, I was busy working on a novel. A novel, you know, I'd done this amazing chapter of a novel. It was the best chapter of any novel ever, ever written, and it was the only chapter of this novel that was ever written. Um, but I used it, I sent that off to a job. There was a job come up at a company called Jagex, guys that make a game called RuneScape. Anybody know Jagex? Cool, okay. Anybody know anyone that works at Jagex? Oh, shit. Uh, okay, oh, so, applied for a job at Jagex. Um, and I didn't play RuneScape. I had no interest in playing RuneScape. It might be that my, I just aged over their kind of target demographic, and that when I was younger, I just wasn't interested. Um, but going for this job at Jagex, I did the whole job thing, you know? When you go for a job interview, you, you've searched the company you're going for your job with, so you're kind of like, you want to know the company history, the facts, what they've done. So I basically crammed RuneScape for a week. Like, I just played RuneScape non-stop for a week, which was painful. Um, and I also downloaded loads of bots because I know how much they hate the bots. So I wanted to see what the bots did that made them hate it so much. And then I considered becoming a gold farmer and just making all my money in the Chinese market. Um, but I did that for a week, went in for the job interview. And as it would be, it turns out I wasn't even interviewing for RuneScape. I was interviewing for a different game. Um, ka -ching, cool. So I got that job and it was on a game called Stellar Dawn. Or as we called it internally, even though we were banned from saying, RuneScape in space. Um, so Stellar Dawn was a game which I think was in pre production for a total of like nine, ten years. Craig, was it about that? Cool. So I was there. I joined in about the second or third year of it, I think it was. Um, and I was there for about three years. Uh, the first six months were amazing. Best time of my life. I was doing everything I'd wanted to do as a games developer. You know, they were letting me design content and then build it. You know, that's, that's a role you don't really see in the industry anymore. And it's a role I'm not sure they even have anymore. It's called a game content developer. So it'd literally be like, look, we need 20 quests in the next two months. So off we'd go, we'd design these quests, get them signed off, and then we'd build them. And it was a dream. Um, next two and a half years there weren't so peachy. I won't go into too much detail because some people know people at Jagex, so it's not fair. But it um, wasn't so great. One big benefit of it, though, questionable, um, was in my last six months, a very handsome fellow joined called Craig Thomas. Craig, once again, give us a wave. Oh, I can point you at this laser. There he is, look. <laughs> Um, and for some reason, to this day we don't know why, they made me Craig's mentor. Um, so we got on like a house on fire. I gave him shit, he gave me shit, we gave everyone else shit, our managers hated us. It was the perfect relationship. Six months after Craig started, the love was just too intense and I decided I needed to leave. Um, and the guy who gave me my job at Jagex, a guy called Enrique, had started his own studio, a um, studio called Bossa. So Bossa are now known for games like Surgeon Simulator, I didn't work on that, I'm not rich. Um, 
But at the time, I joined as employee number nine. Um, and it was a great opportunity. It was the exact opposite of Jagex in the sense that Jagex, when I left, was like 380-something people, and I was joining as employee number nine at Bossa. Um, but when I left, I said to Craig, look, I know you're loving life here right now because you're in your first six months, but um, you get, what's going to happen is in six months' time, you're going to be fed up. So give me a call, and we'll see what can happen. So off I went and worked on a game called Monster Mind. Roughly six months later, my phone rang. Hello? Hey, Joe, it's Craig. I'm fed up here. What can we do? So about, what, a month after that, Craig ended up coming and joining me on the team at Bossa working on Monster Mind. So Monster Mind was a Facebook game when Facebook games were at peak. It was the first ever synchronous multiplayer. So you had these B-movie monsters, you'd invade each other's cities, etc., etc. But I think Craig will probably touch on it a bit more. Don't want to step on your toes too much here. Um, but a big thing from Monster Mind was that when I'd been at Stella, on Jagex at Stella Dawn, um, the game hadn't come out. I'd spent three years of my life working on this title, and it hadn't shipped because... The ways of the world. Um, at Bossa, Monster Mind shipped nine months after I started. So we actually got this game, we smashed it in nine months and released it. This was in September 2011, I want to say. And then March 2012, donk, 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 yeah, animation, bitch. Um, <laughs> we won a BAFTA. So this was mental. We got the nomination and we were over the moon. You know, the first game I'd ever had released and we got BAFTA nominated. Enrique and the guys actually paid for us to all go to the awards ceremony. So me and a slightly larger Craig at the time, not as skinny as he is now, we squeezed into our tuxes. He didn't have a beard then either. Um, off we went to the BAFTAs with kind of game, game world superstars and on top of that actual like celebrities from films. Um, and it was mental. We were so happy to be there. We were this horrible rucker. So it's, at the BAFTAs, it's, for those of you that have been there, you know, it's kind of a name gets announced and everyone politely is like, yes, lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, Monster Mind got called out and we were all like, yes, come on, giving it all the football hooligan. Um, so they kind of read the nominations for best online browser, Monster Mind, Spyro's first Skylanders game, I think the browser based one he did, Sims, so Sims Online or whatever it was called at the time. And then Monster Mind won and it blew our minds. You know, we were this tiny little studio against these big behemoth or other studios and we picked up the award. Um, and it was just, yeah, amazing. Words could not put justice to how good it was. But it also started something ticking. You know, the following week, we'd released a game with Bossa, we'd won a BAFTA, and we started thinking, well, have we hit, have we hit the ceiling of what we can do here? Like, what more can we, as in me and Craig, as individuals, do at Bossa? You know, Bossa's going to go on to do amazing things. I never knew they'd be as amazing as they are. Fucking congratulations to them. But we didn't feel like we could do much more there ourselves. Um, and I'd always said to myself, by the time I was 35, I wanted my own studio. Believe it or not, I'm not even 30 yet. Three weeks away. No laughing, please. I'm not that old. Um, but we were, what, I was, what, 28, 27 at the time? Um, but it felt right. It felt like the best time to start a studio was now. If we're going to do it, let's do it now. When we don't have a mortgage, we have no kids that we know about. Um, so why not do it? Um, so we did what we like to call the idiot method. And we call it the idiot method because... If you follow in our footsteps, you're probably an idiot. We had three grand between the two of us, and that was it. Three thousand pounds saved up between the two of us. And we quit our jobs. So we quit our swanky, old street salaries we had working in London. I moved into my mum's garage. Craig moved into his girlfriend's mum's spare room. And we started a studio. Um, and that was kind of the whole plan, right? We didn't say, we didn't have a game lined up to make. We didn't have a plan of what we were going to do in the studio. We just said, we're going to start a game studio. So we quit our jobs. We started a game studio, and then we were like, what do we do now? Um, but I'm not going to continue that story, because Craig will tell you more about that in his talk. But let's just say we went on to make our first game in about nine weeks, wasn't it? You want me to stop there? Is it, is it treading on your feet? And that was called Janksy. But yeah, Craig will be talking a bit more about that. I'm here to talk about production. Um, so this is a role I got thrown into. You know, I was... Is that the next slide? Oh, fantastic. So I was a programmer who always wanted to be a designer who ended up a boss, basically. I ended up a manager, a producer, a director, whatever you want to call it in a five-man studio. It sounds pretentious. Most important about this was I always thought I'd be doing a bit of coding because I like to code until I hired a technical lead that said, if I get anywhere near his code base, I'm going to get hit in the face. So I ended up Ghostbuster symbol number one, not being allowed to code. Um, so I had to learn how to be a producer, and I had to learn how to be a producer without any mentor, any production knowledge, any guides. I had to basically wing it. Um, 
Craig will tell you the story along the way, but along the way we ended up as executive producers at Microsoft, um, which is mental because we don't really have a fucking clue what we're doing, and we never really did. What's next? Cool. Oh, I do this a lot, by the way. When I don't have preview, I'll go forward a slide to see what I'm meant to be talking about, and then I come back. Deal with it. <laughs> um, five minutes? <laughs> Fuck you. Okay, let's go. So, quickly, production, buzzwords. Good ideas go bad. So this is the dangerous stuff. Everyone likes to jump on bandwagons. You hear words like agile, you hear words like scrum, visual language, MVP. These are terrifying words if you don't know what they mean. What's even more terrifying is that guys at big studios don't know what they mean and ask them to be implemented. Um, so this is a good thing, right? Agile is fantastic. Scrum is fantastic. All this methodology is perfect, but the big thing to know is it's not one size fits all. Ghostbusters number two. You know, you cannot read the book on agile methodology and apply it to your studio as it is written in the book because that's written by a guy that, or girl that applied it to their studio and it fit perfectly. Every studio will be different. There's not many studios where the technical lead will tell the director to fuck off. The La La Studios, it happens on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. So what you need to do is do the research. Look into how this stuff works. Find out what your team is like. Feel the feel for your team, the feel for the project, and the feel for these methodologies, and try and fit them all together. <laughs> So, process and procedure, they're not dirty words. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, people think, you know, oh, we're going indie, we're not going to do anything that the majors do. It's really, you know, majors, boo, indie, yeah. All indie usually means is that you're fucking broke and don't have a clue what you're doing. And we know this for a fact because we're indie, for now. Um, do not be scared of what some of the things the majors do. Do not be scared of putting processes in place and procedures. Do not be scared of handling your projects like a big person would at a big studio because some of this stuff works. Some of this stuff doesn't and they're just old fucking dinosaurs that don't know how to move on. But some of this stuff is good. Test everything. See what works, see what sticks and move on. Fucking hell. Why didn't you tell me before five minutes? I've got... <laughs> so this is the bits we do. Stand up. So a lot of studios will do a daily stand up. Nine o'clock every morning, first thing. Everyone on team gets round together. You state what you did yesterday, what you're doing today, and any blockers in your way. Now, this is there to highlight problems. So if code is blocked by something in design and they haven't had a chance to tell them, it's a very good time to say, OK, so yesterday I was working on implementing Jump. Today I'm going to be working on implementing Jump. My problem is Jump hasn't been fully designed. I haven't got any numbers, blah, blah, blah. So the whole point is called a stand-up is because you stand up. Reason for this is, we're in a games industry, so we're all fucking lazy. No one likes standing up for a long period of time, so the meeting won't take very long. Otherwise, like in studios like Microsoft, five-minute meeting turns into a half-hour meeting, which turns into a 10-day-long email chain, which turns into a 10-hour meeting, and that's not a lie. Um, so stand-ups are fantastic. Because we're remote, we do them over Skype. The reason we can get away with it sitting down is because we don't really like each other, so we don't really talk for more than five minutes. Craig, am I right? Cool. <laughs> So next is sprint planning. So this is effectively, oh Jesus Christ, I took too long on the other slides. <laughs> so this is where you break up and have a visual a kind of identity for your project, where it is. You have columns for what you need to do, what's in progress and what's been done. You sometimes break this down into more. We have five, including QA and stuff. Read about this, it's better than hearing me talk about it for five minutes. But effectively, this is where you figure out your backlog for your project. This is all the stuff we need to get done. You then break it down into tasks and time cost those tasks. Some people do it in time, so some people say this is a three hour task, five hour task. We kind of do that eventually. We sometimes do shirt sizes to start with because time costing is guesswork. So we'll say, well, that's an AJ size shirt because it's going to take a long time. And that's a really skinny pussy Craig shirt, so it's not going to take much time at all. Um, but it gives you good visibility. It lets you know kind of this is a big task. This can take a lot of our time, a lot of our resources. And you'll soon see if you've got too many big tasks. If you end up with a project this big and you've got to get it done in this much time, you're in a bad place. And also, if you've got a project this big and you're doing it in this much time, you've already fucked up Agile. The whole point of this is really is meant to be that you figure out what your backlog is. And if your project is going to take this long, that's how long your project will take. Crunching doesn't matter. Crunching will get more work done, but the work will probably end up shitter because you're working more hours. I've done my fair share of sleeping on studio floors, you know, and it doesn't pay off in the long run. <laughs> I'm getting there, I'm getting there. So this one is super important. So many people forget to play their game as they're making it. And what happens is somebody plays it two months down the line and goes, why the fuck are we doing this? This is awful. And then you have a big design argument. 
that guy turns out to be right, and you're two months down the line, you're looking to make changes. So what we tend to do is, well, so right now we do fortnightly or weekly show and tells. This is exactly how it sounds like in kindergarten. You know, you go, this is what I worked on this week, everyone plays it. What we also do now is more like a nod to the film industry. In fact, we do dailies. So every morning we all play the game together online. We all give our notes at that point, and it helps us to kind of plan out what we're doing moving forward. Great book to read on this stuff is by a guy not in the games industry. In fact, I think you talk about him a bit. Um, Ed Catmull from Pixar. It's a book called Creativity Inc. Check it out. <laughs> I'm getting there. So our development process, how we work is this. We come up with an idea. We make a really shitty looking prototype. And we play that shitty looking prototype and come up with more ideas. Eventually, and this is such an old picture and it doesn't look that good. Eventually, we actually apply graphics to make that idea pretty. The reason for this is simple. If your game is shit and is shit to play, it doesn't matter how pretty it is because it's just a pretty piece of shit, you know? And that's the reality. We apply what we call the Super Mario 64 method. You need to get your game feeling fun, just running around, just controlling, just jumping. Has anyone here not played Super Mario 64? Okay, get out. <laughs> You're in the wrong class. Um, play it. The reason that game is so perfect compared to every other game ever made is because you can run around the castle doing jack shit and have the time of your life. So with this, your game should be fun as just a box in an empty room. So that's where you start. Your foundation is this. Get your movement feeling good, get your jumping feeling good, get your core mechanics and build on that. Because if you build on a shit foundation, it will eventually crumple. <laughs> cool. Um, so everyone's students here. So this is BizSpark. This is for businesses. You guys get DreamSpark, I think it's called. So if you don't know about it, it's Microsoft's thing where you get loads of freebies. So we're a studio with no money and we're all using 10 grand licenses for Visual Studio Ultimate and using tools we could never afford in the real world. DreamSpark lets you do something very similar. So Microsoft DreamSpark, sign up for it if you haven't already. Don't know if you have to go for your university or not, it's free. This is quickly, I'll touch on this quickly. I'm hurrying up, okay. So this is very important. You, uh, you get told, uh, you know, you learn this stuff in shit basics at school and you think it's a waste of your time because it's nothing to do with computing. And the reality is it is, it just needs to go with other stuff. These tools or alternatives by Google, except, uh, the other ones, OpenOffice, are very useful to you. We use spreadsheets more than anything in the world for tracking the studio, for tracking progress, for tracking the project, everything. So get, your, get used to using Excel, get used to making good looking documents. I'll skip Philip Schofield then. <laughs> Sorry guys. Cool. <laughs> so this is the big basic tip. Love what you do. And this sounds stupid, but it's the reality. If you don't love what you do, you will not do it well. And if you don't love what you do, no one else will love it. It's as simple as that. If you end up going to work for a big company and you love it, brilliant. That's fantastic. And honestly, I wish you all the best because some big companies are fucking brilliant. But if you find yourself making games because that's what you wanted to do and you're not enjoying it, it's pointless. You will never be the best if you don't love what you do. So make sure whatever it is, even if you decide halfway through this course you're done, you don't want to do this anymore, you j just leave. Just find something you love doing. And this is my last point. I'm getting off. My last point. Trust your gut. Biggest mistakes me and Craig have made in the history of this studio is when we've gone against our gut instincts. When we've had this feeling that something wasn't right and we've done it anyway, or when we backed off for trying something, you know? Take chances. Make mistakes. I got taught that when I was like eight years old by the big yellow school magic school bus. Um, and that is all the time I've got because I overran. So Thanks for listening, guys.